worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has the great things. See what the Savior has done. See how His love overcome. He has the great things. He has the great things.
no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, light you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. This morning I'm going to be reading from uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34 in the New King James Version. This is about the conduct at the Lord's Supper. There will be three parts to this. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, in part, and I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. This is the institution of the Lord's Supper. For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And this part is about examining ourselves. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner and be guilty of the blood and blood, the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. You know, several books of the Bible discuss God wanting us to be together with one another, with other believers as a church. But it also warned about trouble in the churches with persons against persons, and he didn't want that. 
There are at least five books of the Bible that discuss the importance of communion, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians. God wanted us to know the importance of the church, body working together, to confess our sins against each other, but also to confess our sins, to be worthy of taking communion. Let's pray. Dear God, with all things going on in the world and around us in this country, give us discernment, a courageous attitude, an ear to hear, and comfort those that need comforting with your word, and bless us to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. May this be a true revival happening at Ashbury University in Kentucky. And may we see the fruits of the Spirit all over the world. Help each of us to examine ourselves to find the sin that needs to be confessed daily. And also to confess sins to be worthy to take part in communion. Help us treat each fellow believer that makes up the body of your church of God with love and understanding and forgive those that hurt us. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Amen. Now, today is communion. This is one of the two ordinances that we at West Hills practice an ordinance as a directive from the Lord, that instruction from Him that He expects us to follow. The other is believer's baptism, which the next believer's baptism is scheduled for Palm Sunday, April the 2nd. If you're interested in baptism, you can let us know that as well. Um, I'll let you in on a little secret. No, I'm not retiring. But I'm very far from being perfect, in case you didn't know that. Thank you, Ruth, for coming, and thank you for going. <laughs> I just asked my beautiful wife because I have to admit that there are times that I'm impatient. I'm perfectly willing to wait in line for my turn, but quite honestly, I'm less than thrilled when someone passes me. Unfortunately, my flesh, and we all have the flesh living in us, tends to rear its ugly head when someone attempts to slide by me when I've been just patiently waiting my turn. If you've ever been to Disney World, that's one of the places you can patiently wait your turn and then watch people act up when someone tries to slide by them. I only had one real fight in my life. It was in high school when I was a senior. We were in the lunch line and one of my classmates decided he'd just go past me. So I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going up there. I go, no, you're not. He said, yeah, I go, no, you're not. And then it was any time. He said that, and I said, okay, after practice, because it was basketball season. Well, I went through the rest of the day, and I didn't really expect him to be out in the parking lot after, but he was there with his friends, and the basketball team was there. They basically were like, you guys just have a go at it. We're going to stay in here and watch. I never had a fight, and uh, so we started. I wrestled. I had him down. He goes, no, we're not wrestling. We're fighting. So like a knucklehead, I let him up. And then I proceeded to beat the devil out of him. It was muddy outside, and my clothes were all muddy. I went home and threw them in the wash. My mom never knew what happened. I never shared this story until I waited that they passed, so I can confess that now. Went to school the next day, and my teammates called me Muhammad. And I'm like, Ugh, I hope the coach doesn't hear them calling me that. I didn't know what he would do about my boxing debut. But I don't get in fights anymore, but quite honestly, I still don't like it when people pass me in a line. And it seems that a lot of people live by the principle, step aside and allow me to pass. We compete in sports. We compete in business. We compete even in our homes. And as I typed this, I was discipling uh, an individual man who He'll remain anonymous, but he was at the early service. He shared that his boys got into it, his young boys got into a tussle over a game of Hungry Hippo. <laughs> now, who'd ever thought that Hungry Hippo could bring out the worst, the competition in his boys? The point is this, we like to be top dog. We like to be important. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and it's a church that he planted there. It was a church that he spent, a city where he spent 18 months before he moved on. 
And he's speaking to these believers who, if you read the letter, they're pushing their way to the front of the Lord's table. They're elbowing their way to the bread and the cup. And their mindset was, step aside. You're in my way. Earlier in this letter, Paul commended the recipients of this letter. But now in verse 17, he says, I have no praise for you at this point. Paul was disgusted. He was disappointed with how the Christians were gathering for corporate worship. Specifically, how they gathered for the love feast, which preceded the Lord's table or communion. And Paul said, listen, you're gathering together in the manner that you do. It actually does you more harm than good. So what exactly was it that ruffled Paul's feathers? The problem was that they had corrupted one of the most sacred events in Christian worship, the Lord's Supper. They were failing to properly honor the Lord and had not honored and respected and dignified each other. So as you look at verses 18 to 22, there is divisions at the table. Now you look and it says, Paul said in the first place, he never moves on to the second or third matter. His message is simply this. What I'm about to write in these verses is of utmost importance. Word had somehow reached Paul that the division existed among the Corinthian Christians. He had already spoken about this division in chapters 1 to 4. And remember, this is a letter. Later, man broke it up into chapters and verses so we could reference it easily. Paul knew this church well enough that he suspected that those reports of division, he says, I, quite honestly, I believe that. His concern was that this division caused a less than unhealthy, ungodly public worship. Look at verse 19, and Paul says, there must be some division among you so that it can be determined among you who is adhering, who's following false teaching. When we talk about the visible church, we're talking about a local church. And sometimes the reality is this. Within a local church, there are genuine believers, and there are also pretenders. But in no way does Paul condone the division. He says, listen, sometimes there has to be division so you can weed out who is a real believer and who's just pretending. But he says, I'm not going to condone or approve of your division. And the division he's addressing here is in chapter 11. He pinpoints exactly what it is that has him frustrated. He said, the Corinthians, you hold this love feast. You hold this dinner for the church before you actually partake of the bread and the cup. You have a love feast before you have communion. And there's the problem. At this corporate dinner, many were focused solely on themselves. Here's what's going on. People wanted to make sure that they were at the front of the line and they got their bellies full. Let me explain. Today in a lot of churches, they have covered dishes. We had soup night. And then there's tables. One of my least favorite things in ministry is picking which table goes first. Because you just watch people. And I just randomly pick them. And then it's like, okay, I can see that table over there is getting a little irritated. Because they want to go. They're hungry. And then when you have a covered dish... There aren't a lot of people at the covered dish supper going, I'll go last. I always like the ones with little kids. We got to go first because we got little kids. I'll watch your little kid. You sit in the back here. I'll take your little kid for you. But we just want to go through. And people figured it out in the covered dish. The last ones get the food that looks the least appealing. They don't go, well, I'm going to, that looks good, but I want somebody behind me to get it. They're out for themselves. And I was at a men's breakfast a while back, and they brought up plates of bacon and put them in different places. And one guy took almost the whole plate. And I was like, wow, he must like bacon. And he's not worried about the rest of us. 
Paul states, essentially, at Corinth, it's every man for himself, fending for himself. Get what you want. And don't even concern you. Don't even think about anyone else. Sadly, we read that some people there were intoxicated. They were drunk. While some individuals gorged themselves, others were allowed to go hungry. They didn't have any food. And nobody said, I'll share with you. Some were overeating and others were going hungry. And Paul begins his correction by asking the question in verse 22, don't you have your own houses to eat and drink in? His point is unmistakably clear. If you choose to approach the Lord's table in such an improper way, well, then you might as well stay home. It's wrong to think primarily, solely about yourself. We are to consider the needs of others as we gather for corporate worship. We, we should look around and look at people and see, who can I minister to? And how can I minister to them? We should make certain that every person that walks in here is shown love and compassion. And it's our responsibility to make sure that those who don't have anything aren't neglected. They don't go without. And look at the end of verse 22. Paul asks, what? Do you expect that I should praise you because simply you just choose to gather together? You think I should commend you because you're gathering together? He said, I can't and I won't. So we look on in verses 26, 23 to 26, and we see the central focus of the Lord's table. Paul said, I pass on to you what I've received from the Lord. Sometimes people go, where did Paul receive this from the Lord? I thought the Lord was ascended back to heaven. If you read Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, Paul spent three years in Arabia. And it's quite likely that in Arabia, he spent time being taught by the Lord. He said, I'm passing on to you what the Lord has given to me. Now, they already knew the proper way to participate in the Lord's Supper. We know, most of us, how we should approach the Lord's Supper. But the problem at Corinth was they failed to properly observe the Lord's Supper and the love feast. The instructions were quite simple. Jesus is the very one who introduced, instituted this ordinance as he gathered his disciples in Jerusalem's upper room. Four activities describe the breaking of the bread. It says he took the bread, and then he gave thanks, and then he broke the bread. And that was something that the host typically did. Broke the bread for his guests. And we see that in Mark chapter 6, verse 41. After he broke the bread, then he spoke and said, this is my body. This represents my body. It is symbolic of my body, which is going to be nailed to the cross. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Christ died for us. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died once for sin. He, the righteous one, died for us, the unrighteous. Why did he die? To bring us to God. He took our place. He took your place, my place, on the cross. He bore all our sins on his own body, 1 Peter 2.24. Now, I want to point out something. His death is sufficient. It is adequate for all. 1 John 2.2 2 says that Christ died for the sins of the whole world. Sometimes people say, well, how can one person, how can one individual sin pay for the, or death? How can that one death pay for the, cover the sins of the whole world? Because of who that one was. It is God incarnate, the second member of the Trinity. His death is of infinite value. He died for the sins of the whole world. It's sufficient for the whole world. He died for you. But listen carefully. It is effective, it is efficient only for those who appropriate it into their lives. Romans 10, 13, whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. We have to call in the name of the Lord. He gives you a gift. He says, here's the gift. It's eternal life. You have to put your faith in me. 
You have to appropriate what I've done for you into your personal life. You have to receive that gift. If somebody says, here's a gift, you have to take it. You have to open that gift. He says, here's eternal life, but you have to invite me into your life. And then he said, do this in remembrance of me. Each and every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are to call to mind the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul then turns his attention to the cup. And this cup was taken after supper. It represents the new covenant, the New Testament, the new agreement in Jesus' blood. Jesus' sacrificial death, his shed blood, paid our sin debt. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus has made it possible for us to have eternal life, for us to have forgiveness of our sin. God made it clear back in Genesis that he required a blood sacrifice to cover man's sin. Remember Adam and Eve sinned and then they tried to hide from God when they couldn't hide, God's calling out to them, but they tried to cover themselves with aprons of fig leaves. But if you read in Genesis 3, it says God covered them with animal skins. Now think of it, to get those animal skins, God had to shed, shed the blood of those animals. And so God made it clear to cover man's sin, a blood sacrifice was required. In the very next, next chapter in Genesis 4, Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's sons, bring a sacrifice to the Lord. Cain, it says, brought fruit and vegetables from the land. Abel brought a blood sacrifice, an animal sacrifice. God accepted Abel's uh, offering, but not Cain's. Cain got angry. God said, listen, Cain, why are you angry? You know this, Cain? If you do right, you will be accepted. Cain represents all those who try to worship God on their own terms. I'm going to please God by joining a church. I'm going to please God by doing good works. I'm going to please God by giving money. Those are all man-oriented, and our basic root problem is a sin problem. We've all sinned, and then the Bible says the wages of our sin is death. Cain said, I'm going to worship God in my own terms. God rejected that. God made it clear that he wanted a blood sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And if you read Hebrews 9 and 10, it says, day after day, the priest in the temple stood and they offered sacrifice because those blood sacrifices could not permanently eradicate man's sin, wipe away man's sin. They all pointed to Jesus. And then it says, but this priest, who is Jesus, he offered himself for our sins, and then he sat down because the sacrificial work is complete. There's no more need for a sacrifice. Jesus is our Passover lamb. He bore, his, he bore our sins on his own body. He shed his blood to cover our sins. And look at verse 26. Paul informs his readers exactly why they should take seriously the eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup. He said, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. We are declaring that Jesus and what he did on Calvary's cross and his subsequent resurrection is our only means of salvation. There's not another way. Jesus said, I am the way, and nobody comes to the Father except by me. Verses 27 to 34 teach us that we should take great care in observing communion. It is a serious error for anyone to approach the Lord's table in some carefree, flippant fashion, not really thinking about what we ought to be thinking about, which is the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. We should come with pure hearts. Psalm 139, 23, and 24, David says, Lord, search me and then show me if there's anything wrong in my life and then lead me in the way of life everlasting. So our prayer should be, Lord, I'm giving you permission, your spirit permission, to search my innermost being and show me if there's any unconfessed sin in my life. Whether it's a sin of an attitude, a bitterness, or resentment, or envy, or jealousy. Whether it's words that we've spoken, whether it's deeds that we've done, thoughts that we've had. Lord, show me. 
And if we're bold enough and humble enough to pray that, I guess he'll show us. And then that word confess means I agree with you, God. I agree with you. It is sin. I don't have any justification for it. I don't have any excuse for it. I'm not going to downplay it. It is sin, Lord. Forgive me. And 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he is just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Paul also wants his readers to examine themselves, as David said, to see if there's unity in the body of Christ. God desires that we be one. Psalm 133, one, how good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. Ephesians 4, 3, there's one body, Christ is our head, strive to keep the unity. Do all that you can to make sure there's unity in the body of Christ. And know that there are seven things the Lord hates. One of them is sowing discord among the church. He wants us to be one. In John 17, Jesus prays, Father, I pray that they may be one, even as we are one. And then he said, I pray that, I pray that the body of Christ might be one so that the world will know that you have sent me. One of the greatest evangelistic statements is unity in the body of Christ. And I said at the first service, and I've said before, Satan's goal is to divide and conquer. He wants to divide marriages. He wants to divide homes. He wants to divide communities. He wants to divide churches. He doesn't even care what the division is over. I was meeting between services with someone, and he said, that message was for me. Chaotic night last night with his family. And he said, really, it was silly stuff, simple stuff. I can't tell you how many people come in and go, we fight over the most ridiculous things. We fight over the most crazy things. Satan doesn't care what you fight over, just so you're not in harmony. He wants us to be one in the body of Christ. That means we shouldn't care who goes first. That means we shouldn't care who gets the best meal. We shouldn't be like looking around, wondering about that. We shouldn't care. If somebody takes our God-ordained seat, we just go, you know what? I'm glad there's somebody else here. And they took my seat. Rather than go, I'm, you know what? Quite honestly, I'm going to have a hard time worshiping today because I'm not in my seat. That happens. You know, the stink eye? Some people get that. Go, man, they, I don't know what I did, but obviously I did something. You maybe unknowingly took somebody's seat. I had, a, I had a laugh because when I was at a former church, not everybody knew. You couldn't see. It was a lot of people in it. And one guy was walking up the aisle, and he's looking like, Ugh. Then he realized it was my wife sitting in his seat. So it's like, Ugh, doesn't matter who is sitting there. It's not your seat. Now, if you want to give a million dollars to the building, it will be your seat. <laughs> if you want to give a million dollars to the building fund, we'll take that and run with it. But otherwise, it's, it's like this is the body of Christ. We love each other. We're here to serve each other, to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus. It's not about us. It's about what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's about our brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus set the example. And I often think about the disciples in that upper room as, and then they come later to realize exactly who Jesus was and exactly what he did in going to the cross and then his resurrection. You know what they were doing on the way to the upper room? I'll tell you what they were doing. Fighting over which one of them was most important. Now think about that. They were arguing over who is the most important. And then all of a sudden, they're in the upper room. Who washes whose feet? That was a servant's task. But Jesus, who left heaven where he was worshipped, by the angels, came to this earth, was born to the Virgin Mary, was born into poverty, into a poor family, and then went around here, the earth, preaching and teaching, and it comes time to wash feet. That's the servant's task. Think about it. Those guys should have been knocking each other over to wash Jesus' feet. They weren't about to do that. 
That was a lowly task. So Jesus takes off his outer garment and washes their feet. And then I think, what in the world were, was their thoughts when they realized, wait a minute, this Jesus, we've been following along, he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is the Savior of the world, and what in the world were we thinking? We're arguing over which one of us is more important in his presence. How can we be doing that? It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And it's about serving and loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord's table is to be a celebratory time. Focus on Christ's honor and the church's unity and the proclamation of the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus. It's about his death, burial, and resurrection. The bad news is we're all sinners. We're spiritually dead. But the good news is Jesus did for us what we couldn't do. He paid our sin debt. Not everyone who gets sick or dies is a result of sin. But if you read Paul's words here, and he's led by the Spirit, he's saying, listen to me, you people at Corinth, because you're observing communion in the wrong way, some of you are getting drunk, some of you are ignoring your brothers, some of you are overeating, you know what, you're not doing it in the right way. And because of that, some of you are sick. And then he goes, and some of your midst, some of you, some of you in your midst have died. If we will humbly and properly judge ourselves, examine ourselves, Paul said, you won't need to be judged by anyone else. So you are invited to join us and partake of the cup and the bread. This is what we call open communion. You don't have to be a member of West Hills Community Church. You do need to be a member of God's family. By that, I mean you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. And then that you're willing to allow the Spirit of God to search your heart. And if you will do that, you are welcome. You're invited to join us as we partake. In the moment, the deacons will be coming forward, but you'll get a container with the wafer and the cup together. You might want to peel back the first layer to get the wafer out, but we will take it together. We will pray for the bread, and then I'll read a verse. We will take it together, and then we will drink of the cup together after we pray for the cup. You are invited to join us. Let us pray. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward at this time, those that will be serving communion. And if you not sure about your salvation, you're sure you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, you can pray a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, today, Lord, I admit, I agree that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin and I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, today I'm putting my faith in you for my salvation. I want to follow you from this moment on as the master of my life. If you prayed that prayer, know that you began eternal life with the Father. You're part of the family, the family of God. That can never be taken from you. Lord, thank you for this ordinance. Thank you that Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own choosing. And Lord, we thank you for that unconditional, everlasting love that we sang about today. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. Still, you gave yourself for us. And so, Lord, I pray that you continue to speak to our hearts as we bow our heads and get ready to take of the bread and the cup. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can remain seated, but I'm going to have uh, Pastor Steve, if he'd ask the Lord's blessing on the uh, bread at this time, and then we'll pass them out and we'll eat it together. So, Father, we just come humbly to you right now, and we thank you for this gift of your son, Jesus, who uh, gave away his life and, Lord, broke, allowed his body to be broken for us. And so, God, we give you thanks for it, that, God, we are healed by your stripes, by your wounds, and, God, we give you thanks and praise for it today. And, Lord, may uh, it change the way we, we look at you and the way we look at others and the way we look at ourselves and how you love us. Amen.
the Lord Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray for the cup. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that Jesus loved us so much he went to the cross. As we partake of the cup, let us remember that salvation is free, but it didn't come without a great cost. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Ted Voitko if he'd close us in prayer. Uh, we have a song first, but you can stand together and we'll sing the song. Savior 